joined by Savik Datta, who is the data science and technical analytics lead um, at Facebook's uh, product and integrity operations. Um, today, we'll be chatting through uh, how he's worked on attributing metric variations with statistical uh, models. Um, Data Science SG is a volunteer run meetup that's been around for um, several years in Singapore. Um, and uh, we're, we're very grateful that you joined today. Um, always feel free to let us know what we can do more uh, to improve, what kinds of topics you're interested in, and if you have suggestions for uh, what needs to come next. Um, we're also very grateful to engineers.sg who are recording this session um, and uh, the talk will be up on YouTube uh, later. So I'll hand over to you, Savik, now, and thanks so much again uh, for your time today. Thanks, Anima. Um, hello, everyone. I um, cannot see anyone, so I'll try my best uh, to just make this as, a, as interactive as possible. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, I've attended a few talks in the past, but have been uh, on the other side, so uh, really excited. And uh, hopefully what uh, I'll share today is of uh, help to everyone. Um, so we'll try to do my best. Give me a moment to share my screen. <clears throat> awesome. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Perfect. So uh, this talk is going to be about attributing uh, metric variations with statistical models. Uh, the way I'm going to approach this is I'm going to give you all a very uh, high level introduction of what I have been doing, uh, then talk about some of the general applications in the industry, then move on to the premise of the problem, and then finally into the analytical solution that is going to be the focus of this talk. So <clears throat> uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so statistical models versus uh, machine learning. Uh, this was something that was new to me as well uh, when I learned about the fact that there are a few differences between the jargons. They are mostly used in an interchangeable manner, uh, but statistical models probably have more mathematical uh, background to it and they have been built by uh, statisticians. Uh, machine learning, <clears throat> on the other hand, is of course built on the same principles, but uh, has mostly been developed by computer scientists. So it follows um, an iterative or algorithmic approach in many cases. And uh, statistical models are uh, built on a bunch of uh, mathematical assumptions. So that's the subtle difference, but uh, at a very uh, high level, they are probably interchangeable. And the reason I'm talking about this is because uh, in this talk, I'm gonna focus a bit on the mathematical interpretation of uh, the model that I've used and how that can be used to uh, create impact for business. Uh, so applications of uh, analytics in the industry, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, most of the folks over here are aware of uh, predictive uh, functional applications. That is, how will unknown or unseen data get some quantitative meaning? Uh, this probably occupies majority of the uh, analytical modeling applications in the industry uh, when we want to predict something, right? Uh, we also have descriptive and prescriptive. Uh, descriptive means what has happened in the past and uh, prescriptive is given some data points, what is the best course of action to take? So the reason why they are in bold or in bolding is because uh, my uh, solution or the talk that I'm going to be discussing fall somewhere uh, between descriptive and prescriptive and takes uh, pointers from both of these areas. Uh, <clears throat> there are a few um, other jargons as well, I think diagnostic, um, but like, yeah, at a very high level, these are the major categories of any analytical model in the industry. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, so the premise uh, of this problem is that uh, we want to protect users on Facebook and hence we want to keep the ecosystem clean, right? We want to remove bad content, uh, not only in an effective manner, 
but also as soon as possible. So effectively and efficiently. Um, these are the jargons that are of interest over here. What I'm going to focus on is the efficiency part. Like that is how fast or how soon can we uh, clear that content uh, from the platform. So the higher human reviewers uh, to enforce on content alongside machine learning systems, and this talk is going to be focused on um, the human review portion. We quantify human review performance via multiple metrics. Uh, one, of, one such metric is efficiency. And this is a fairly uh, broad metric that is used uh, with different connotations in the industry. In our use case, uh, we can pretty much assume that this is jobs decision per hour. So a, a very high level overview of what jobs over here mean. Uh, content comes in the form of jobs or tickets and reviewers essentially take a decision on them, uh, whether they should uh, stay live on the ecosystem or not. Of course, the uh, unit of time can be anything. It could be jobs decision per second, minute, hour, day. Um, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to keep it jobs decision per hour. Right? And the way that this ties back to the original problem statement is uh, higher efficiency implies that uh, we want to take down bad content as soon as possible. Right? So this ties back to the overall problem statement that way. If we have figured something that is bad, we want to clean it as soon as possible. Now, uh, we track this metric uh, in a periodical manner. So the lowest grain that we track it is at the daily level. And uh, this varies uh, day over day, sometimes outside of the no normal range of variance. Uh, a non-trivial dip in efficiency could potentially indicate lower productivity. So for example, if I'm tracking a metric and there are spikes and or dips, uh, that would mean that it is outside of the normal range. And in the case of efficiency, if it falls below a certain range, it could indicate lower productivity. Of course, it could mean anything else as well. Uh, and we will have to do the root cause analysis, but uh, lower productivity is uh, something that is of interest to us because at no given point of time, do we want our productivity to go below a certain threshold because that essentially means that uh, potential bad content that we have identified is staying live on the ecosystem. And that is something that we don't want. So we want to clean it as soon as possible. Uh, this is a snapshot uh, of how the data might look like. And uh, folks in operations research might be uh, able to relate to it uh, because uh, this is pretty much uh, what control charts look like. Uh, you have the within control and outside of control error margins. And you can assume uh, that we also allow an acceptable threshold of efficiency. And uh, as you can see in the graph, a dip is something of interest to us and we want to investigate why that dip happened. Okay. So yeah, so the open-ended question over here is how do we understand what caused efficiency to request? So there was a dip and we want to understand why that happened. Uh, now, there can be multiple ways to approach this question because all of us gathered over here are interested in data. I'm going to focus on how do we get a quantitative solution to it. So what I did, uh, of course, there are multiple possibilities, but what I did was uh, convert this open-ended question into this quantitative question, that is, what factors can we attribute our metric movements to? And this can tell us what areas need more attention. Uh, there are so, there are multiple ways uh, in which this open-ended questions uh, can be converted into a quantitative question, but uh, this is just one of them. Okay. And <clears throat> would like to talk about some of the potential solutions uh, that were there uh, at the top of my mind. So we can always uh, answer this question via qualitative methods by doing research and hypothesis, working with certain uh, teams that are uh, responsible for these metrics and build a narrative around that. Uh, but again, like this is a qualitative solution and um, qualitative solutions work to a certain extent. Uh, of course, if we can tie any quantification to it that just makes uh, it a bit better, uh, it is more impactful and it is more understandable, like why, why a certain regression happened, right? Uh, 
So one of the processes that we already had in place was to identify causal factors individually and uh, look for correlations with efficiency. So for example, say there are two factors hypothetically that are maybe directly proportional to efficiency and inversely proportional to efficiency. So maybe uh, what we can do is we can just uh, track the movements of these individual causal factors and see how they uh, move during the period of dip. And if there is anything of interest, we can just report that. So we can say that, yeah, we found that causal factor one was moving and hence that might have been the reason behind why efficiency uh, caused litigation. But one of the cons of this approach is that it looks at individual causal factors uh, independently and we are never able to get a cohesive narrative. So this is where uh, the model based or the statistical model based solution comes into play. Uh, the best way to go about this would be uh, to combine whatever causal factors we have into an explanatory model and uh, see how the narrative comes up from there. So uh, one way to think about this is one causal factor will probably never impact a metric just on its own. It has to be a combination of uh, multiple factors. So can we maybe model all of them together to see if efficiency uh, has been moving in accordance to all of them, right? So the statistical model that I used is uh, a multivariate regression model uh, where the dependent variable is efficiency and the independent variables are causal factors. I'll go a bit into uh, the details of what the in, uh, dependent and the independent variable looks like at, uh, in a few slides, but this is what I uh, did at a very high level, right? And this is where the, uh, like we have built the model. So what now, this is where the prescriptive part comes into play. Attribution can essentially be calculated uh, based on the principles of how we interpret all of the coefficients. So uh, pretty sure like whenever you are uh, reading any uh, introductory chapter on multivariate regression, uh, they'll talk about how to interpret coefficients and that is what the impact of a particular coefficient on the dependent variable, if only that uh, coefficient moves or, or the variable attached to that coefficient moves and everything else remains constant. This is exactly the same thing. Uh, how much efficiency will change if only one of the factor changes and uh, nothing else changes and so on and so forth. So at a very high level, this is a pretty fundamental concept in regression. And uh, I'll also go ahead and say that it is a pretty simple concept as well. Uh, but at the same time, that can be used to create major uh, impact to the business if, if uh, the problem statement can be tied back to this. So that is what I'm going to focus on uh, in the next few slides. Just quickly wanted to give a snapshot of how the table uh, might look like. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, uh, like folks over here who have built machine learning models are familiar with such tables. Uh, you have all the individual factors as columns and uh, efficiency, which is the dependent variable will feature something like this. Uh, what I also did was, uh, of course, like no data comes in this manner. We have to do a bunch of wrangling and manipulation. So the final version um, of the table that was to be used uh, for the model building process, what I did was I built that in the form of a pipeline uh, so that it can be accessed uh, in an easy manner on an ongoing basis. <clears throat> okay, uh, so the snapshot of how the statistical model looks like, uh, the final solution looks something like this. We want to explain the regression in efficiency. Actually, uh, I'll, I'll probably not use the term regression because that's the model uh, as well, but we want to understand a dip in efficiency, right? And maybe uh, we can say that we want to understand a Y person dip in efficiency. Then uh, can we present a solution where we are able to say that uh, to explain that Y person dip in efficiency, X1 person can be attributed to factor one, X2 person can be attributed to factor two and so on and so forth such that the sum of the percentages is equal to 100%. Right? Uh, the factor with the highest contribution to efficiency 
can then be focused on by the responsible team. So, for example, if we are able to say that hey, efficiency moved ten uh, percent, and seventy percent of that can be attributable uh, to a change in causal factor one, uh, and the rest of it is basically trivial. Can we talk to the team that is responsible for factor one and see what's going on and fix that? So this gives us a pretty good way of narrowing down what to focus on and ties back to the open-ended question that is how do we understand the bit in uh, efficiency? Right. Uh, what I also did over here was uh, package this in the form of a dynamic tool, which can be used by any non-technical audience. This is something that is, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, uh, folks over here will be able to relate to it, but uh, technical solutions need to be used by uh, multiple people. And maybe uh, one of the areas of impact that all of us analysts can create is by either communicating that in the simplest form possible or providing the tools um, and or resources for anyone to be able to use it. So. Uh, what I did over here was I implemented this model in the form of a dashboard where you are able to select the uh, dates, the timelines, uh, and, and the individual factors as well, and just push a button and a model runs in the background and it gives you some visualization that you can actually use. So the final visualization looks somewhat like this. So you'll see that uh, the y percent dip in efficiency can be attributed 50 percent to factor one uh, 20 percent to factor two uh, 15 percent to factor three and so on and so forth and the sum of all of this is equal to 100 percent uh, and the factors over here are basically the quasi factors i'm going to talk a bit about the steps in the model building process uh, uh, the first step is the research on causal factors. This is both qualitative and quantitative. I'll broaden on uh, this particular bullet uh, in a few slides. I'll go a bit deeper. So I'll, I'll leave that for the time being. Uh, the data uh, collection process and the data cleaning process is super important. Um, majority of the data lives in different places and we need to create pipelines, uh, join them on particular keys, and uh, basically wrangle and or manipulate the data so that we are able to use it in a manner. The final uh, version of the data looks something like this. And so it is definitely a non-trivial portion of the model building process. Uh, outlier treatment uh, is a very important step because we are dealing with human review. There is a lot of uh, variance in the data or there uh, can be variances in the data due to a multitude of other reasons like bugs in the system or uh, uh, just like erroneous data loggings, you know. And uh, it becomes pretty important for us to consider whether uh, spurious data points should be a part of the model because we need to take a call on whether these data points are important or not. Because if it's a real effect, then we should be accounting for it, right? Uh, if it's not a real effect, then we should be uh, discounting that, or at least we should consider what to do with that. So this involved a lot of qualitative research. Uh, like for example, if uh, there is a data point that looks uh, like a pretty major outlier and that happened uh, three months back, uh, it it is or it was a hard task for me to figure out why that was the case. So I had to do a lot of qualitative research over here. And the major, major chunk of this qualitative research included me talking to the respective teams uh, to get a sense of hey, what happened back in history. And uh, we, we did figure out uh, that some of the data points indeed were a function of uh, error logins and or outliers or something went off and it was unexpected and it will not be classified as legitimate. Uh, it just happens that in this case, majority of the outliers were uh, erroneous points. So I removed them and that is usually the uh, easier approach. But of course, if that is not the case, then you need to figure out how to treat outliers. Um, and uh, like maybe you build a secondary model for that. But that was not the case um, for this particular problem. Right? Uh, Feature scaling is something pretty important, especially for regression-based models. 
uh, although I did uh, I, I did scale the features, but just wanted to point out that because we are using a descriptive version of the model and we are not uh, predicting over here, uh, I did not uh, foresee a uh, lot of problems creeping in because we are not dealing with unknown data and so and hence everything should be uh, expected like the data won't be outside of the range uh, over there because we are building on past historical data. But just wanted to highlight that um, feature scaling is pretty important. It becomes especially important for predictive tasks, uh, maybe not so much for uh, descriptive and prescriptive tasks. Exploratory data analysis is pretty important, especially correlations when you're building a regression model. Uh, you need to check for correlations between the independent and uh, dependent variables individually and take a call on uh, whether uh, they should act as features in the final model or not. Uh, because a lot of the research comes in the form of causal factors, uh, you would expect some sort of correlation, but in general, it's always a good idea uh, to uh, do the exploratory analysis step. Okay. Model diagnostics is also something really important uh, for regression-based models. And this is also something that I'm going to go a bit deeper uh, over the next few slides. And I'd like to stress on the fact uh, that statistical models, because there is a lot of mathematical interpretability uh, attached to it and are essentially built on certain assumptions, model diagnostics become pretty, pretty important. Uh, but like say in uh, machine learning where you're just uh, building black box models, you probably don't need to uh, take into account what are the assumptions uh, that the model is built on. Uh, so one way to uh, look at this is that you probably have more flexibility when you are building black box models, but unfortunately that is not the case for statistical models. You have to look at the uh, assumptions because that is a uh, basis on which you will be able to get some interpretability out of it. So this is something really important. Um, model evaluation. I used uh, adjusted R square uh, over here because the model needs to fit my data pretty well in order for it to explain uh, variations that are affecting the business. Right? Higher value of adjusted R square means uh, my linear model accounts for majority of the variance in efficiency. Uh, Adjusted R square and R square can be used interchangeably. The only flaw about that is uh, R square automatically increases with higher number of features. So adjusted R square uh, takes that into consideration. Uh, my model did not have uh, a lot of features because these are essentially causal factors. Uh, so it, the adjusted R square values were not very different from R square. Right? Uh, statistical significance of coefficients is pretty important. Uh, and this is where I'd like to stress again on the fact that we are building a model to get a lot of interpretability out of it. Maybe in predictive tasks, we can have a few features that may not be statistically significant. Uh, but over here, it is pretty important because we want to be able to uh, attribute it to the business and take decisions out of it. So uh, if there is a statistically insignificant uh, feature, then we should be uh, talking about it, at least thinking about why that is the case. Right? And the final step is the attribution calculation, uh, which is really where the uh, meat of the problem is. So causal factors, right? Uh, this is... Uh, this is the bread and butter of the model because uh, what we are trying to answer uh, here is we want to attribute efficiency movements to causal factors. Uh, so identifying causal factors becomes really, really important, right? Uh, I'll give you one example of a type of causal factor uh, that I use in the model, and that is time spent per job. If you come to think of it, uh, efficiency and time spent per job is pretty much inversely proportional. If you spend more time doing a job, then at the end of an hour or the first hour, you your efficiency will be pretty low because you'll get through less jobs, right? So since this is inversely proportional to efficiency, uh, we know that there is causality in there. And so this is a very good uh, candidate for having causal impact. And this is a good candidate ultimately to be used as a feature in the model. Uh, I use a similar methodology to identify other factors, but I will like to highlight that the cleanest 
uh, form of inferring causality is to run an experiment. But in many practical situations, it's hard to uh, run individual experiments uh, just because of uh, logistical constraints, maybe time is a constraint. And so what I did was I used uh, a middle ground over here. I used correlations. Of course, we all know that uh, correlation does not infer causality. So it was a combination of using this as well as doing a lot of on-ground research with relevant teams and getting that intelligence on whether there is some causality or not. So basically brainstorm with relevant teams on other potential causal factors and get uh, rigid data points that, okay, these factors might have some causal implication on efficiency. So this is how I uh, figured out all the different causal factors that were relevant to the model. There were some good candidates uh, of causal factors that I had to completely discount. Uh, because we did not have enough data points over there. And at the end of the day, it's probably better for the business at least to provide a picture uh, that makes sense uh, to the problem statement rather than trying to include as many features as possible. Because again, we are pivoting on the interpretability of the model and we don't like we are not really focused on whether this model can give us good predictions or not. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, the slide about model diagnostics. And what that means is we want to test the assumptions of the model, uh, especially with uh, regression, there, there's a bunch of uh, assumptions that we need to take into consideration. The graphs that you see come from a, a synthetic data set. And essentially these are uh, the graphs that you get for free if you're using R. Uh, even though I use Python in my case, I just wanted to highlight uh, what the model diagnostic process looks like. Right? There are a few assumptions in multivariate regression. So for example, we don't want multicollinearity between features. So I had to check for independence. And it just happens in my case that certain causal factors were really uh, highly correlated. And I just had to discount one of the two. Of course, you can uh, use other uh, methods if you still want to keep everything. Like for example, you can use principal components analysis and uh, trim down the dimensionality space. Uh, I uh, took a call on eliminating a few features, again, based on the qualitative inputs from the team, uh, because uh, we don't need to spend our energies on all different factors that are out there. Maybe uh, only the important ones that matter are good enough. So multicollinearity is very important. Uh, we need to check for linearity and uh, homoscedasticity, which is constant variance. Uh, we want the residuals uh, uh, to follow a normal distribution with mean zero uh, and a constant variance. And uh, the QQ plot and the histogram of residuals uh, can give us that. So we'll see the normal QQ. It's also called the normal probability uh, plot. And uh, Cook's distance for uh, influential points uh, and or outliers. So the model diagnostics was a pretty important step. Uh, there are certain uh, methods that you can use uh, if your model diagnostics are not up to the point. Like, for example, if there is a uh, divergence from linearity or homoscedasticity, there are certain techniques uh, that you can use in order to make that, uh, make that happen. So, for example, you can do a power transformation uh, and so on and so forth. It just happened that in my case, uh, the data uh, fit the model assumptions pretty nicely. Uh, so I didn't have to worry about that a lot, but then there are techniques that uh, we can use uh, for the linear, for, for the assumptions of linear regression to kick in. Okay. okay, we'll talk about attribution calculation. Uh, this is probably like the most important step. And it just happens that this is probably the easiest step. And uh, we just needed to think about this uh, at, at, a, at a much earlier phase. And uh, this is where the meat is. Um, and uh, it is really built on the fundamentals of whenever you uh, read any introductory chapter on regression, right? Uh, the one thing that is needed for the attribution to work is that the model needs to fit uh, the data pretty well. Otherwise, we cannot get any interpretability out of it. And if we find ourselves in a situation where the model is not fitting the data well, then we need to take steps uh, analytical steps in order to fix for that. 
right? So uh, if, if you remember the graph that I was showing a while back, you usually have a pre-period and you have a post-period um, during which the dip happens, right? Uh, so you have a pre-efficiency and you have a post-efficiency. So whenever you see pre and post over here, it essentially means data from the pre-period and data from the post-period, right? So if I were to attribute uh, efficiency delta to just factor one, the way I would uh, think about this is, okay, how much change can I see in efficiency if only factor one changes from the pre-period to the post-period and everything else remains constant, right? Uh, this is really how we try to interpret the coefficients as well. Similarly, if I want to attribute something to factor two, how much will efficiency change if only factor two changes from the pre-period to the post-period and nothing else changes? So you'll see in the formula, uh, for factor one, I only use uh, the factor that is in the post-period, assuming that only this one has changed and everything else has remained unchanged. So the pre for factor two and factor three, I'm using three. Similarly, for uh, factor two attribution, I'm using the pre data for factor one, the post data for factor two, and the pre data for everything else, right? And so on and so forth. And the percentage uh, attribution is basically the efficiency drop from factor one divided by the uh, sum of all efficiency deltas due to all of the factors. So that's how we can attribute a certain percentage to factor one and a certain percentage to factor two and so on and so forth. Uh, at this point of time, I'll again go back this, to this graph. Uh, from, from the calculation that I just got, if I am able to visualize that in this pseudo waterfall uh, sort of a chart where I say that, okay, the dip in efficiency can be attributed uh, x1% to factor one and x2% to factor two and so on and so forth. This gives all the ground level teams a good insight into what was the problematic uh, cause behind this dip. I, like, I don't want to call it problematic, but what was the uh, most important factor that we should be focusing on because of which the dip happened, right? And then we can uh, reach out to the ground level teams and figure out uh, why this happened. So hence, uh, getting a solution that we can fix uh, in the future and so that uh, we prevent similar dips from happening in the future. Yeah, so uh, other, the, other, the, the last step that I took in the entire process was to make this a one button uh, push to provide all results. Uh, so I packaged this in the form of a tool uh, so that anyone uh, in my team and in my extended team can just use. Uh, I conducted tutorials, uh, bound back sessions and office hours uh, because a lot of the code, not like majority of the code is written in Python. And um, if people wanted to learn what was going on in the background, I conducted sessions for that, uh, conducted office hours and also implemented feedback. This is something that I feel is pretty important. And uh, we who build technical solutions sometimes discount for that is the uh, value that comes from feedback. Feedback is essentially a gift. And um, the folks who are using this uh, to build solutions, um, the, the feedback loop is really important. So I also iterated the module based on the feedback. Uh, model retraining is pretty important over here. How frequently do you retrain your model? Uh, and for this, I had to do a separate analysis as well, where I just wanted to check how much variance there is in the type of the data over long periods of time. And based on that, uh, figured out a frequency that really works. Uh, so we don't, we don't need to be able to retrain uh, the model on a daily basis, for example, uh, depending on how varied the data is. So that is something that I had to take into consideration. Uh, model interpretability is pretty important. Uh, of course, like in a lot of the super complicated uh, machine learning algorithms, like say deep learning and whatnot, it is still uh, a black box for many of us. And we don't get a lot of understanding why a certain decision was made by the model, right? And that's where I guess statistical models are a bit 
uh, clearer at least in what they are trying to do. Uh, but it is it is pretty important because uh, just being able to understand and model data and using that interpretation to uh, tie it back to the real world can create a lot of impact to the business. So this is where I'll end and uh, very quickly, uh, I forgot, I just remember that I forgot to give an introduction of myself. So I'll, I'll just quickly do that. Uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I have been at Facebook for a little above uh, six years uh, now. And uh, before that, uh, I used to work at an ad network. And before that, I graduated from college uh, with degrees in mechanical engineering and a master's in mathematics. At Facebook, I've had multiple profiles. I uh, started off as an analyst, then became a solutions engineer, then moved back to being an analyst and uh, pretty much work at the intersection of uh, product uh, operations and uh, risk mitigation. And uh, yeah, very passionate about solving problems with data. So hopefully the uh, session was a bit helpful. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I think we can end now and more than happy to take questions uh, this. Yeah, thanks so much, Savik, um, for, for the talk. Uh, we've got a lot of questions in the chat, uh, which is excellent, uh, but I'm conscious also of time. So um, I'll be picking a few and then we'll go from there. So maybe let's start with a question from uh, Johan. Uh, he asks, uh, the dips are themselves outliers. So in the outlier treatment process that you outlined, um, how did you make sure that the dips themselves were not removed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that, that's a pretty good question. Uh, the outliers that were finally, uh, yeah, uh, yes. So that there is a mechanism for us to identify uh, what data points are outliers and what data points are not, and this pretty much happens at a pretty high level even before we dive into uh, any analytical solution. So for example, uh, if there is a dip that happened for a particular date, uh, we have to get confirmation from the ground level teams and the uh, teams that are working directly uh, with the human reviewers that indeed there was a dip in productivity and that was uh, seen at multiple places or by multiple people and it was verified, right? So the points that we are investigating, uh, they are a part of the model. Uh, the parts that were removed uh, also comes from a lot of uh, investigative work where uh, we get again, the same level of confirmation from all the teams working on ground uh, that those were erroneous points. But it is a pretty hard problem uh, because uh, for all the outliers, for all the individual outliers that were there, I had to research individ uh, individually through all of them. So that was a really time consuming process and then had to uh, uh, filter out the ones that I didn't want to use. So in a, in a nutshell to answer uh, the question, uh, it is basically qualitative research uh, that gives us that level of information. Got it. And uh, from Weeming2, uh, let's say we discover that two factors are highly correlated, um, but both of them are correlated with each other, say 0 0.5. How can we decide which one to put into the model or can we put both? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, when you put in, uh, when there is multicollinearity with the model, uh, the model diagnostics take a hit and uh, we lose a lot of the interpretation. So. Uh, they shouldn't be a part of the model. They can be a part of the model if we are somehow able to remove correlations. So maybe use techniques like principal components analysis. But then when, once you do that, you also lose a lot of interpretability because you need to convert it to a low dimensional space, convert it back and then uh, get that level of interpretation. And that is something that uh, I didn't want to do. Uh, but the answer to this question as well is by talking to the ground level teams. Uh, if there are, uh, so first of all, I'd want to clarify that uh, uh, if, uh, I did figure out uh, if there is any multicollinearity or not. So if individual factors are multicollinearity, we need to take a call just based on what I mentioned, uh, whether we should keep one of the two. Now the question comes in uh, 
as to which one of the two we should choose. And yes, the answer to that is also qualitative research by talking to the ground level teams, uh, by also using certain insights like, do we understand which factor is more in control for us, right? If you come to think of it, if uh, factor one and factor two have high correlation, that basically means both of them will have similar impact on efficiency. But, but maybe factor one is something that we can't control as a team uh, or, uh, uh, yeah, the opposite over here is that maybe we can control factor two uh, pretty well, right? By making certain changes in the process, either in the operational process or uh, in the tooling process, we are able to get that level of control. And hence, that is more relevant to us, right? So that level uh, of research was also done. And uh, there are certain factors that we don't really care about. Uh, so that's also one of the reasons. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, this needs to be, because we are holding a ground level team accountable for the movements, we need to take into consideration what factors we are able to control. So that was the basic uh, principle behind this uh, solution. Got it. And um, I think we have time for just one more question. So I'll try to combine three. Um, given the given what you've been talking about, uh, you know, it, it's really clear that how you determine the causal factors is critical to solving this. So, um, uh, did you use uh, you know other kinds of factors beyond what you already gave an example of um, in terms of what's inverse to efficiency? So, for example, Abhinav says, did you use a factor capturing the difficulty of content re review impacting efficiency? Because some pieces might be difficult to flag because of you know unclear policies and things like that. Um, and uh, just to also add on to that, um, how do you respond if um, if it's not something that uh, if a causal factor is something that the team can or can't act upon? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the answer to this is also similar to uh, the last question. That is, the final factors that went uh, into the model building process basically comes after uh, multiple rounds of alignment with the ground level teams uh, and a consensus that these are the factors that we should be focusing on because this is in our control and this is important to us as well because they might have other uh, repercussions. And uh, so, so that is the most fundamental answer over here. Uh, about considering other factors, yeah. Uh, that was a fine trade-off between how much time should we spend in getting the best model out there versus what can get the job done, right? Another uh, data point over here is that the basic principle of this approach is interpretability. So we want to get as much interpretability as possible uh, without making the model too complex. Like say, if we have 50 different factors, then it just becomes pretty hard for us to uh, move anything concretely because we don't really know what to focus on. Uh, so that was a fine trade-off that I had to find, uh, like how many factors are important to us and we can realistically move and then not worry about uh, using or researching on uh, different factors out there beyond a certain point of time. Got it. And I think we're right on time. So uh, thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you so much, Sovik, for the session. Really appreciate it.